Hello and welcome back to my little corner of the world, listeners. This is Mike Booth, coming to you from Super City, Cape Central, the hero hub and den of ne'er-do-wells. I'll be your smooth-voiced guide through the wonders of my fine little home as we explore the side of the city the news rarely shows you. I was realizing that if this show is going to be anything worth anything, I need to start being a bit more consistent. I mean, if you guys don't know when to tune in, you can't listen to me live on the airwaves like God intended. So hopefully starting soon, I'm going to have things all set up and squared away so this can start to look a little bit more like a presentable presentation and not some fly-by-night radio blog. Now the first item on that list, though, is to finalize the name for the damn fashion segment. I keep flip-flopping on what to call it and what kind of direction the segment should go in, so I'm just going to throw out the idea board entirely and call it the fashion segment. We'll see what happens with it as it goes, but today on the fashion segment, we have the hero, Skyatook. Now, if I'm being perfectly honest, I really wanted to do a spotlight on this guy because he's got a lot going for him in the coolness department. Unfortunately, there is not a whole lot we know about him, because to my knowledge, he's never said a word. He might actually be a mute for all we know. He also doesn't make, like, any public appearances. He just shows up to fights, then disappears when it's over. We're not even sure if Skytook is actually his name. People just started calling him that. But this is the fashion segment, so on to his costume, which is one of the few things we do know about him. You may have guessed from the name, but he's a Native American superhero. A lot of the American Indian heroes tend to shoot for a design that kind of meshes with their you know, family tribe, but Sky Took seems to break that mold. He wears a suit of living armor made of natural materials. Leaves, wood, vines, even dirt, that kind of thing. He's even got three-fourths of a halo around his head made out of cloud that just kind of hovers over him. Now, unlike normal armor, his armor is actually really light and completely silent. This stuff can take a beating, too. I've seen his armor take tank fire with minimal damage. And he's also got this sword made out of wood that seems to be stronger than any natural element on Earth. It's cut through steel and just about anything you can think of. So he basically threw out the whole tribal ancestor thing and went with a forest knight design. The only real Native American symbolism he has is the handle of his sword, which is a series of carved animal totems, but even they seem to change every time someone looks at them. No one can agree on what the handle actually looks like, it's always different. Now, some of my online friends who are obsessed with cape stuff have spent years trying to figure out more about this guy based on what little we know, but the biggest thing we've been able to glean is that he might be a North American Earth God who exists in the same pantheon as Earth Empress. Unfortunately, with as little as we know about him, we have no idea if that's right, but I love his design. It's outside of the box, it's different, and it's just really cool. Aside from Sun Sentinel, you don't really tend to get a lot of night-themed heroes outside Super City UK. So in all, I give Skyatook four and a half capes out of five, and I'm knocking him down just shy from perfect for purely selfish and petty reasons, because I also went down the Skytook identity rabbit hole back in the day and lost weeks of time trying to find anything out about this guy. But moving on, it's time to dip into the increasingly bottomless mailbag and answer one of your burning questions. Our first for today's show is, what is civilian life like in a city with so many capes? To be honest, it's a lot like living in a regular city in a lot of ways. I mean, you have to learn to put up with some extra bullshit, like occasionally turning into another species or waking up in the middle of the street after a city-wide psychic-induced coma. But I mean, we deal with a lot of normal stuff too. All the cape fights means there's constant construction going on, so traffic's usually hell, even with super-powered workers. And crime is obviously something you have to accept as an inevitability. But if you get into the right mindset, it can be kind of fun. There were actually quite a few days where I got to miss school or work because I found myself stuck in a hostage crisis or was otherwise incapacitated by some cape or another. Very few villains ever actually go out of the way to hurt civilians, though, so you usually don't have to worry too much about that. Honestly, some of the most dangerous capes are the ones that don't realize how powerful they are, which is a great segue into a twist on a familiar segment. Welcome to our first villain spotlight, and this time we're pulling double duty with everyone's favorite bungling burglars, the loony lovers themselves, Gun Gun and Kim Kim. Gunter Gunderson and Kimberly Kim are the long-running power couple of villainy, with more attempted thefts under their belt than any other villainous cape. 
they'd probably be nearly unbeatable if they weren't so goddamn stupid. For those who don't live in SC Prime, a little background, because everybody here knows these guys. Gun Gun has the ability to create magical guns, and Kim Kim can make magical chemical compounds. Unfortunately, they don't seem to have any control over what effect their stuff will have, so every time they rob a bank or hold up a museum, it's a total crapshoot for any hero trying to take them down. One day they may be able to make things sticky or bouncy, another day they may cause horrific disfiguring mutations. They've made some pretty damn powerful stuff over the years, and are responsible for a small but respectable amount of unwanted superpowers. But here's the thing, despite all that, they only get away with about a tenth of the crimes they pull. And to illustrate exactly why that is, I've decided to tack on a sub-segment to this segment called Only Gun Gun and Kim Kim. Now all of these are actual verified things that these lovable lunkheads did that perfectly illustrate why they are so terrifyingly but adorably inept. So, <laughs> only Gun Gun and Kim Kim would try to take down the entire Cornerstone 5 with only a tickle gun and unstable laugh fumes. Only Gun Gun and Kim Kim would forget to hire a henchman to extract them after using a single-use teleportation ray to make their getaway to the moon. Only they would scream, bow before the power of my red-hot goose cannon during a robbery. And no, it wasn't a metaphor, it was a cannon that shot live flaming geese. Only they would create an army of chemically mutated and highly intelligent rats for the sole purpose of feeding half-cocked Henry, their cat that is 90% gun. Only they would forget to wear masks until halfway through a high-profile robbery, then remember it, but continue to call each other by name. Only they would melt down half a ton of gold with no way to actually transport the now red-hot liquid gold. Only they would fake their own deaths by taking out an article in the newspaper without using fake names to pay for it. Only they would attack Pornographique with an aphrodisiac gun. And finally, only Gun Gun and Kim Kim would fail to realize until it's too late that just because you can put sentience granting chemicals into the barrel of a gun that shoots sadness, doesn't mean you should. <laughs> oh man, I love those guys. But reaching back into the digital mailbag, we've got another question from viewers like you. This one asks, what makes the Super City so special? I've got a hero in my neighborhood, and we don't seem to have any major problems with him. It was worded in a lot of ways, but on the whole, this is one of my most asked questions. There's a lot that goes into the answer too, but I'm going to try to break it down as simply as possible. The biggest difference is probably the support systems. Lone heroes operating outside of Super City are completely on their own, both financially and responsibly. Super Cities do a lot to fund up-and-coming capes and have a bunch of different programs to help learn and develop their powers. And good luck finding a hospital outside of Super City that's equipped to deal with someone who eats lasers and farts radiation. Normal cities also tend to be less forgiving and more likely to sue if you, say, accidentally knock down a building during a fight. And part of the reason for that is because you don't have the Norns. Now they're kind of a long story, but the short version is that most of the luck or fate manipulation capes get hired to make sure that if there's even a small chance some catastrophe or near-fatal accident won't kill someone, then that person will pull through. Maybe they won't be in great shape, but they won't be dead, you know? Add the Doctor's Needful and the half dozen capes on every city block to that, and you've got a heck of a safety net. Normal cities just do not have that backup system, so lone heroes tend to fall into one of three camps. Either they're so careful or low power that collateral damage never becomes a problem, or they're so good at not getting caught by the cops and lawyers that they continue to fight crime. Or they get busted and either get sued into the dirt or forced to move to a super city where they can't cause any more trouble for the normies. I've got nothing against loners, mind you. It takes a lot of guts to do what they do, and a lot of them are really cool people that are fighting for a cause that they genuinely believe in. But all I'm saying is if you suddenly get a neighborhood cape, maybe don't get too attached, because they may not be there for long. Moving right along, we've got a new segment called What Kind of Lame Power Is That? You see, there's a lot of powers out there, and some are usually considered better than others. Then you've got the strange, the weird, and the seemingly useless. But I've followed the capes business long enough to know that there's no such thing as a completely useless power. So this segment will show just how cool or useful some of the more out there powers can be. And we've got a doozy of a first candidate. Someone whose powers are literally shitty. Crapshoot. His one and only ability is whenever he points and snaps at someone, they poop themselves. On top of that, the magical incontinent poodle that gave him his powers has to be in constant contact with him for his powers to work. Sounds disgusting and lame, but hear me out. On a sheer win-to-lose ratio, 
Crapshoot was one of the most successful heroes in the business because no one wanted to fight Crapshoot. Villains literally gave up at the sight of him because no one wants to go to prison or end up on the news with their favorite costume fully loaded, you know. Not only that, but he's managed to turn his poodle into a bit of a mascot with a very successful line of gross-out toys based around him. He's gotten so infamous among the villain crowd that sometimes robotic or cyborg capes that wouldn't be affected by his powers try to take him out. But Crapshoot has so much money put into security measures at his home, they almost never get past the front door. So what kind of lame power is making people poop themselves? The kind that makes you so successful you can retire at the age of 35. And what's this, another new segment? Why, how generous of me. This one's called This Day in Super City History where I take a look into the history books and headlines of yesterday to bring you some of the defining moments of our fair city. Today's story will be Choo Choo Twain versus the Masteroid. First, a little background on the hilariously named Choo Choo Twain in question. Twain was a relative newcomer on the cape scene with a heck of a shtick. He was a descendant of Mark Twain, and one dark night came across a ghostly set of train, twa train tracks. He stuck around to investigate when down the line came a train screaming like a banshee. That train was the spirit of the rails, a ghost train powered by the demon that had been summoned into its engine by arcane technomancers. The train stopped just before it could hit Twain, and he felt this unstoppable urge to climb into the conductor's cabin. The demon that lived in the engine used to trick people into getting on board so he could eat their souls. But apparently, Twain was so charming and funny, the demon decided not to eat him after all, and instead bound his soul to the ghostly train forever for his own amusement. So you've got this guy dressed in period late 1800s clothing, rocketing around the downtown area on a demonic train that ran on rails of fire. As you can guess, he managed to gain a bit of popularity pretty quickly due to his charm and the fact that his fighting style basically boiled down to hitting people with a ghost train. Enter the Masteroid. It was a living asteroid god that got its rocks off by slamming into increasingly large planets, causing extinction events. Apparently, it's what killed the dinosaurs. It took personal offense that it hadn't finished the job the first time and was on its way back to Earth to kill us all. And normally, no problem. Just send a team of heavy hitters to the surface of the rock, smack it a few times in select places, and wham bam thank you ma'am cosmic stardust. But the Masteroid was not so easy to take down. It drew strength from every planet it had collided into, and after countless eons of destruction, it was practically unkillable. Until Choo Choo Twain got an idea. Before the Masteroid could touch down, after everyone had thrown everything they could at it, Super City scientists were able to figure out that it was powering itself with all the souls of the things it had killed before. And since Twain's train engine literally ran on spirits, when he found out he figured he might be the only one who could stop it. So as the shadow of the Masteroid encompassed the entire city, Choo Choo Twain sent the spirit of the rails blazing straight up into the sky in a towering inferno of steam and steel into the god's surface. He hit like a 10-ton bullet and kept on drilling straight down to the Masteroid's black heart, absorbing souls all the way. Everyone in the city watched as the ancient god began to slow and the lights in its city-sized eyes began to dim. Just as Twain reached the core, the Spirit of the Rails engine reached critical mass, blowing all three of them into a million pieces and saving the city. Normally, that would be the end of the story, but everyone knows that in a super city, there's always a chance the good guy comes back, even if it's not always the way you expect. About a year after his sacrifice, Choo Choo Twain pulled up on the edge of Little Afterlife. In all the time that he'd been driving the Spirit of the Rails, Twain had managed to forge a pretty strong friendship with the demon burning in its engine. After Twain's death, it made a deal in deeper hell to bring him back, at the cost of the demon's own power. So now it's Twain's soul that drives the spirit of the rails, and he spends his time ferrying people between the lands of the living and dead. It's thanks to him that Little Afterlife is the booming community of spirits and ghost-themed heroes that it is, instead of the tiny haunt that it used to be. Every day, for the meager price of two pennies, Twain will take you across the veil between worlds, all expenses paid with a complimentary joke or two. And that is the tale of Choo Choo Twain, how he destroyed the Masteroid and became a major figure in Little Afterlife. Oh, I just love that story. I was actually planning on ending today's episode there, but I just noticed the mailman just dropped off some physical mail in my mail slot, so I'm going to... I'm going to take a quick break and see if we can do one last mailbag segment with some physical mail. All right, I haven't had a chance to look through this, but uh, let's see. Bill, Bill, Junk, Magazine. Oh, oh, a letter here from the Yokels. 
Okay, you guys remember them. We did the fashion segment on them last time. They're the uh, Immortal Hillbilly guys. Oh my gosh, it looks like a thank you letter. Okay, I'm going to skim this real quick, and then I'll read it out loud to you guys. Oh, crap. Oh, shit. Okay, I, I just saw the last letter in the pile, and it's a cease and desist order from the FCC, so I, I need to go make some phone calls, like, right now. I'm, I'm sorry, but uh, stay super. Mike Booth signing out.